Maypen Cemetery in Kingston, the capital of Jamaica. Miami, Florida, August 1992. A massacre at a crowded restaurant leaves four dead, 18 wounded. The gunmen are Jamaican gangsters. Since 1986, we estimate uh, over 4,500 deaths uh, attributed to Jamaican violent crime. London, November 1993. The funeral of community policeman Patrick Dunn, shot dead in Clapham by Yardie drug dealers. Their recourse to violence is much quicker than any other group, certainly that I've known. And the overtness of it is quite staggering. Kingston, Jamaica, the home of the Yardies. Assignment examines why the ghettos of Kingston have produced international drug dealers feared by the police on both sides of the Atlantic. And the thing they like to do is shower their victims with bullets. Maypen Cemetery in Kingston, the capital of Jamaica. Here lie the gunmen, the hustlers, the drug dealers, the exploiters and the exploited. Many of those buried here never made it to the age of 35. Even the biggest of all are brought down to earth. And no one was more powerful than Jim Brown, the original Yardie. He was overlord of a community which became the crucible for a new breed of drug dealers. Under his control in the 1980s, the Yardie was born. This is the close-knit world of Tivoli Gardens in West Kingston. Drug dealers from Tivoli are found in London, New York or Miami. But they never sever their links with home, which they call their yard. Tivoli was Jim Brown's yard. Here he was revered. Jim Brown was a community leader in our area. He was loved by everybody. Old, middle-aged, young, everybody. Jim Brown bankrolled Tivoli. Much of his wealth came from crack dealing in the United States. His gang, the Shower Posse, led the Jamaican assault on the US drugs market. Some of his riches came back to Tivoli and helped fund community projects. Old people, they would come and hug him, kiss him. I know people love him off real because the person he is. Because the person he is, always trying to help someone, say something to them, word of encouragement, saying to the kids, talking to the kids, telling them that they must um, try to achieve a better tomorrow because, you know, they have to go to school and things. He's a principal person. Believe in a lot of Jim Brown came to Miami in 1984 to see what was uh, what was going on with his uh, shower posse and their drug dealing activities. And while he was here in November that year, he walked into a house and executed five people. He walked around each one of them and shot him in the head with a 45. Jim Brown is a bad, bad man. When he was arrested at the request of the Americans, he faced charges of murder, drug trafficking, extortion. From prison, he fought a legal battle against extradition. He lost the fight, but he never stood trial in an American court. It was said that too many powerful people would have been implicated if he had. Jim Brown was burned to death in his cell, officially accident, more likely murder. Edward Siaga, the former Jamaican Prime Minister and Jim Brown's patron, led a funeral procession of 35,000 people. Tivoli is Siaga's constituency and Jim Brown had brought in the votes. His drugs gang had established the Yardie connection in the United States and Britain, but in Jamaica he remained a hero. Look at the man in terms of how the community respects and treats him as a protector of their community. Thank you.
In 1980, Siaga's love affair with the electorate was consummated when he won power for the Jamaica Labour Party, the JLP. The United States government liked his right-wing stance and channeled support through the CIA. The money was used to buy guns, which were distributed to party activists in the ghettos. On the other side of the divide was Michael Manley, leader of the left-wing People's National Party, the PNP. Manley, too, had his power bases in the ghetto. And the fervour of the support for the two parties created the biggest ideological gulf in Jamaica's history. It was a time when the Cold War was being fought in the Caribbean. Cuban guns and money were behind the PNP. During the 1980 election, Kingston erupted in an orgy of violence. At least 800 people were killed as the parties battled for votes. Of the gunmen who survived, many have since become yardies. Tivoli's world is still polarised. Every aspect of life is touched by political division. Kill him! Kill him, blood slash! Kill him! And as ever, Edward Siaga is present to express solidarity with the home side. These are his people, body and soul. The manager of the Tivoli team is known universally by his street name, Popcorn. He's an activist for the Jamaica Labour Party. Hello, yeah. Everything all right? I'm going to lie. To Tivoli folk, he's a community protector, like Jim Brown. In the 70s, Popcorn was a JLP gun runner. Sometime, life in the ghetto, yeah, no work, nothing, you know. No work, nothing, because if I PMP, all I JLP, I not cut him up, I shot him. And at the same thing, two sides. Like me, well, I PMP, I mean, what's the well, and if I do, I mean, I got damaged. I mean, I got damaged. Him. I feel like I come on. And the side out of the street start fire. We have to fire back. Now we're not bored, man. You see? So you see. That side they have gone, that side they have gone. We buy, we buy, we gun them still. I mean, that man, I try with my little gun, you know. And anyway, I go, I carry it, man, because I'm a labor right, you know. I'm a figure out that the PMP, so they shoot me. Yeah, my enemy are the PMP, them, because them don't know what is good. All them know if you do is stay out of the street and rob people, shoot innocent people. A victory for Tivoli, yet another excuse for gunfire. In the ghetto, the legacy of the politician is the M16. Tivoli Gardens was the birthplace of the Yardies, but it's in central Kingston where many of the most active dealers and gunmen are now found. Within the area, there are two distinct ghettos. The PNP stronghold, with the unlikely name Tel Aviv, and its neighbour Southside, which is unequivocally JLP. Separating the two is Rosemary Lane, the front line. It's calm now, but at election times there's bloodshed across this line. And within these two enclaves, all authority rests with a series of street corner dons. And their role in the social structure of this city should not be underestimated. I began a journey across the ghetto, starting on the corner controlled by Chubby, a JLP fighter who's been in prison for murder. Chubby owns a bar, and like all the community dons, is known only by his street name. 
He's been a leading Southside Don for 20 years, even surviving an attack by a PNP assassination squad. Smoking marijuana is ingrained in Jamaican culture, especially amongst Rastafarians. It's illegal, but here the authority of the police carries little weight. The street corner Don, supported by political chiefs, is the crucial figure of authority. And to maintain control, he has to enforce an alternative form of justice. What happens to people that step out of line? Then? Sometimes they get beaten. Uh, badly? Yeah, badly. And in the police don't like it. Within the community, you can quash certain things before it reaches the law. But you know, when you reach the law, you can get a sentence. Might be a man mad with two licks, and that can let him behave himself and might do another thing for the rest of his life. Chubby's domain is a bleak one. The politics of partisanship has left an indelible mark here. Communities where the gunmen flourish are known in Kingston as garrison towns. Who are the people here? They're on a bridge, you know? I'm on a bridge in there. Yeah. They're your brethren? Yeah. And this is your headquarters? My corner, yes, my headquarters. Southside has few services. This street has been polluted by raw sewage for months. Most of the people in this area, uh, no job? Yeah, most of them. I'll call that, I'll mean 75% of the people are not working. And who do have no job? They got to hustle. Hustling means drugs. Dealing and using are part of the fabric of life. Half of all crack users are teenagers. How do people afford to buy crack? It's an expensive drug. When we do it, them steal all them parents' things. Rob outside and all them things, you know, to support their habit. And then you have the crack, some crack people who smoke crack in this whole building over this side here, so. Crack is a uniquely addictive drug. The user will do anything for the next hit. The evidence of crack use is everywhere, but the profit margins for the drug dealers here are too small. The ambitious seek their fortune abroad, in Britain or the United States. Bordering Chubby's territory is Renker's Corner. The Renker's leader was Delroy Edwards, known as Uzi because of his use of the machine gun of that name. The Renker's gang still control this corner, even though their leader is serving six life sentences for murder in a US jail. Members of the Renkers formed a vicious Yardie gang that grew rich on crack trafficking in Brooklyn and London. Uzi was known for his brutality, but to those left behind, he was a benefactor. Send some things and when they even come in, send carry on clothes, support, send things. They make us all live good down here. Then. Everything set for us. Send us sneakers and support. Keep a treat for the little kids. Give a little passage to the old people and, and make everybody feel comfortable. And it was so much that I stopped working, started doing drugs. What happened is I became one of my best customers. Instead of selling, I started using more than anything and then being messed up in the mind. Eventually one day I got busted in the house, I ran out, jumped to my car, police started shooting at us, I tried to got, get rid of the drugs, but I failed. The police was up on us so fast, I didn't even know what happened. I got shot three times, trying to get away from the cops, threw away a .38 slug revolver. When I got 10 years in the penitentiary. I know this stuff destroys people, but the money, this greed for that cash, Today I learned better. I'm, I'm 37 years old today. I wish I'd go back to 17 where I could make that same decision again in life. With crack, there are few winners and many losers. 
And despite so many friends either dead or in jail, the Renkers still find it impossible to resist the temptations of the American cocaine trail. Who don't really want to go to the state? Yeah. Me, myself, I want to go to the state right now. Uh, as you come, come see, you have a job, just sitting down. From Southside, I crossed the front line and stopped at the corner controlled by Brumi, a gunman for the People's National Party. In last year's election, he was almost killed by a JLP fighter. But surviving a bullet in the gut has merely enhanced his reputation. Brumi will spill blood for the politicians because of the help they give in return. <laughs> I'm going to give them my help in the still. Give them my money or get some goods to them. Or so anything where they can get. It depends on oh, where you are. If they have a place where they can get the, the, the items, then they get it and give you. If they can't, if they give you money, and you would buy it and try to set up your little business and try to turn it over. And what do they expect back in, in return? So well, in return, you know, they may expect it for us, no, so we there, so no, so we now have a change for them. I mean, say, at all times, them can rely upon we when election corona and we we they have to support them. Yeah. Many of Broomie's followers will take up weapons at election times. Amongst his crew were yardy dealers like Thicker, who's chilling out before returning to the crack trade abroad. Thicker was earning a thousand pounds a day in Bristol before getting caught in a drug war. He says yardies succeed because they're so single-minded. The willpower, the drive to go. You know what I'm saying? They love it. And because they love it, they'll do it full time. The English guys, like most Afro Caribbean guys, they do it, but they've got other things to do, like, you know, drive around. You know, they love driving, you know, clubbing and things like that. You know what I'm saying? A lot of Jamaicans don't really go nowhere. They don't know where. They come from Jamaica and they go to Bristol. That's where they came to live in St. Paul. They don't in and around Bristol, nowhere else. They outnumber and that. The, 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 the British guys on the front line, yeah, and they're more violent. They show more respect to Jamaican because, you know, the first thing you say is gunshot. I then moved on a hundred yards to the territory controlled by Lockie. He's just been bailed on a murder charge. He was accused of killing a JLP opponent, but the politicians who protect the gunman got him off. It probably won't be the last charge Lockie faces. How old are you? 32. 36? That's, that's quite old, isn't it? I mean, some people don't survive that long. Well, well I respect most of my friends who don't live that long. I mean, I'm dead. That's how my prospect. I believe he's me in 100. I watch my grandchildren grow. You understand? But, as I'm sure you said, most of the time, people terminate such plan for you vendetta, right? <laughs> so it just goes on and on? On and on. That's what I tell you. It's a generation thing. It never stops. Uh, my son can never come. This side and that side. And I'll see you even. Him born with the with the intention of saying, boy, them kill him uncle, them kill him brother. Oh, them boy, they just so well. It never stops. <laughs> Under the pressures of life, the social structures here are in flux. Two children in every three don't know who their father is. And for many, the strongest role model on the streets of Tel Aviv is the Yardi. For Yardis like Michael, the gun is the emblem of authority. His rules are simple, kill or be killed. If no, a gun come like is not nothing. I was a man of a gun. And uh, you have to run. The most weak. What would happen if the police caught you with the gun? They might shoot at you. Oh, they might run it now. They might shoot you and they might with it. You know, you have got fireback shot from them. As I left Tel Aviv that evening, I didn't have to go far to understand the role of the police in the ghetto. At the central police station, there was a wait.
Sergeant Norton Stewart has been shot dead by a drugs gang. Policing the ghetto is a perilous job and casualties are common. The death of a colleague provokes bravado as well as mourning. But the force is handicapped by rampant ill-discipline. The beating of suspects is routine. And every year the police kill at least 150 people while making arrests. Where evidence is hard to find and witnesses are intimidated, the police answer is shoot first and not bother with the questions. For years, corruption within the force has allowed some police officers to grow rich from drug trafficking. Some of the Yardies arrested abroad have turned out to be Jamaican policemen. For the dedicated, the rewards are few. Problems besetting the force have led to the appointment of a new police commissioner, whose task is to root out corruption. In his first three months, he sacked some officers and demoted others. The aim is to persuade the ghetto communities that they should trust the police rather than the street corner dons. This small minority are, exists as community protectors, they call themselves. Their finance is a result of narcotics and illegal sale of narcotics. My mission is to try and not only remove them, but by bringing the communities closer to the police, as it has to be. By doing that, one will replace those community protectors by legal and legitimate policemen doing their duty. But change won't be easy. In the fight against Yardi crime, the police enjoy little trust. When British and American detectives have tried to track down drug dealers who fled to Kingston to evade capture, they say their requests for help from the Jamaican constabulary have been frustrated. The police have failed to penetrate the heartlands of crime. Many blame their impotence on politicians. They protect the community dons who bring them votes. The police are left uncertain and aggressive. The police are going in, beating up on the guys on the corner, shooting somebody arbitrarily. It's just a way of getting out their frustration and pretending that they are doing police work. Because for so many years, they have not been allowed to do their work properly. And this has bred within the force itself a set of police whom are by and large untouchable themselves. Even their superior officers are afraid to deal with them because of their political backing. In the garrison towns, the politician gets what he wants. A by-election was held in a PNP constituency in downtown Kingston to secure a seat in Parliament for the finance minister. The successful candidate, Dr. Omar Davis, won 99.8% of the votes. His three opponents got 19 votes between them. The party activists had done their job well. <laughs> Jamaica has all the institutions of a democracy. But though speech is free, it's hardly candid. Corruption has seeped into the pores of this society. Too many people have something to hide. None of the politicians we contacted was willing to speak on camera. And who can blame them? There are so many questions to be asked about Jamaica and drugs. The answers could be incriminating. These rocks, cooked from powdered cocaine, are the lifeblood of the Yardis. A kilo of cocaine bought in the Caribbean will sell for ten times that amount in Britain. 
converted to crack, the profit margin becomes astronomical. Crack and corruption go hand in hand, and those who know what's going on are usually scared to talk openly. Politicians, police, businessmen, you name it. Everybody's involved somewhere along the line. Right through the ranks, you know, right through the ranks, you know. You know it's not only people from the ghetto here who are involved, you know, because they don't have that vast amount of cash to supply the market, you know, so, you know, it's coming from people who have the cash to spend. You know, because a man in the ghetto, he can't find a hundred thousand US dollars to go and get those who've got real wealth in Kingston live in these hills above the city. The ambition of most yardies is to make a fortune abroad and buy a mansion back home. It's said that money from international drug dealing has built many houses here. Danai Williams is facing a 100 million pound fraud charge relating to car imports. It's said that some of the luxury vehicles he brought in were for political friends. The Americans say his business is a front for the laundering of drugs money. He may face extradition proceedings for his part in a yardy operation in Texas. Danai is an active supporter of the PNP and helps to provide money for the community dons to keep the party's influence strong. He's confident that his political services will keep him well away from jail. The trial is not something that I can be convicted. There's no way I can be convicted. I don't have any worry about it. There's no worry in my mind or anything that there will be a problem out of this trial. Do you have friends amongst the politicians or ministers and people that um, you know would not want to see you convicted? Well, I wouldn't say yes and I wouldn't say no. Jamaica is the ideal transshipment point for cocaine. The powder comes in from South America by light aircraft or by sea. It then travels to Miami, New York, and on to Britain. This is the Coke Trail. <laughs> Kingston Airport. It's estimated that one in every four flights leaving here has cocaine on board. Jamaican officials are suspected by foreign law enforcers of getting their cut from the most lucrative trade in the country. But behind them are some of the political figures, according to US undercover agents. All they have to do is call up the airport and the ship port and say, hey, you know, my guy's sending a shipment of cocaine or a shipment of wheat to the United States or the UK or Canada and that, you know, they'll be flying different um, guys at the airport and the uh, port authorities. What do the politicians get out of this then? They get money, and lots of it too. It goes on until they're out of power. Because this money here, they have to make the money when they're in power. Because when they're out of power, they have enough money and the Swiss bank, or a friend came in, to live a happy lifestyle after they retire from politics. Tony Brown retired from a political career of sorts. He can now afford to relax with his wife at a fashionable beach near Kingston. He was once a top killer for the PNP. Now he's a yardy drug dealer. 
When he murdered a policeman just before the 1980 election, he had to go on the run. He fled abroad, like other political gunmen. He was based in New York, but when his crack dealing came under investigation, he used the Yardi network to slip into Britain. The best shot at the time was to go to London. I spoke to a friend. Then that friend put me on to a friend. So that friend took care of getting me somewhere to live. Then he took care, like taking me to meet other friends. So I just did what was really correct. Like they said, don't go here, don't go there. I just tucked in. The key thing to all this is having false documents, isn't it? How easy is it to get them? Getting false documents is like buying a ticket for a bus. So long as you have the money up front, that is really what gets you false documents. Jamaicans call the British passport the black book. The trade in crack cocaine couldn't function without it. Some passports come from corrupt officials in Britain. There's no shortage of experts with the skill to provide a convincing new identity to the Yardi gunmen and dealers. There's camps in Jamaica where I can get your passport, get your picture out, get back my picture in, and it looks just as good. You get a brand new passport somewhere or another, you get it. You want a visa for America, you get it. You know what I'm saying? You want, if your if your pass, Jamaican passport is messed up, you get a brand new passport. Brand new. You know what I'm saying? No trace of an old one. That's it. You get dollars. New York City is the main artery of Yardi drug dealing in the United States. From the mid-1980s, they simply swept the other drugs gangs aside. Many Jamaican exiles have put down roots in Brooklyn, bringing with them the culture of Kingston. It provided the ideal cover for the Yardis to move in. The Jamaican street gangs became known as posses. One of the most successful, with links to the People's National Party, had its nerve center in this building. A posse from Kingston called the Gully Men killed the owner of the block and for seven years they ran it as the headquarters of an operation dealing in marijuana, heroin and crack cocaine. It was a license to print money. At its peak they were pulling in $60,000 a day. And the arrival of the galley men is a textbook example of the way in which the Jamaican gang seize a piece of turf and make it their own. The vast crack factory symbolized the potential of the US market. But the gully men's fortune became the envy of other yardies, and the violence of Kingston was transplanted to a new arena. A lot of shootings occurred right here on this corner. There were numerous drive-by shootings. Uh, eventually, the most, the most ruthless of that family driving by was eventually killed, and one of the shoot alleged shooters of that individual and the murderers was Desmond Brown. Desmond Brown, protected by his yardy network, is now on the run. We tracked him down at a safe house. He's wanted for murder and faces a life sentence. The man he killed was a Yardie rival from Kingston. Them come from the same area when me live born and grew up to, just as well as them, but them was bigger man, more than kids, that's how they know me. But the mother was to leave from the community of Jamaica and me in the other place where they hide until they make it them themselves to America. So, then they have problems with my family. The Yardies never lose their links with Kingston. As they fought for control of the Brooklyn crack market, they turned to their old street corners for recruits. They would not really uh, trust any of the local Americans here to work. What they would do is recruit their own people from back uh, in Jamaica, in the Kingston area, surrounding neighborhoods. They would bring their own people up here to the United States using false passports or green cards for whatever reason to travel. Uh, bring them here and the new people that would arrive would now become the workers on the street actually selling the drugs. In Jamaica, you know, anywhere, someone drop the money and you want to. 
did you come to New York on your own passport, or false documents? Mm -hmm. See, false documents. So you've been living on false documents? Yeah. Time will be approximately 1 p.m. Agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the so-called untouchables, are planning a drugs raid. We'll set up on park right here, and then Carlos and I will be in the graffiti van here, the informant. He's not going to buy it, but judging by their reaction, I'll give you guys the call. Their target is a gang of Jamaican yardies making and selling crack in Brooklyn. Guys try to run. That's beautiful. God bless you, Joe. Howie has seen a one of the defendants with a gun on him. Is that right, Howie? The hospital that we need at St. Mary's Hospital. A report by the Bureau identified 30,000 yardies in the United States. They don't have an organized structure like the Mafia. Their alliances are forged by the street corner politics of Kingston. The only thing that would stop us from going in, if he, he says, we don't have anything right now, come back in a half an hour. Well-timed, the agents find one of their targets as expected in this apartment. A second has been arrested at the front of the building. We got Dennis downstairs. Yeah. I'm sorry to tell you that. Uh, that was quite much. With one apartment secured, it's learned there are suspects in another. The arrested man has been cooking crack for the afternoon trade. No, I mean, we have stuff. We have product. The captive, still in his teens, is an illegal immigrant. Constant seizures of crack have been a blow to Yardi operations in the United States. In the US, arrest for crack dealing means an automatic jail term. If just five grams is found, it's a mandatory sentence of five years. The ringleader who was arrested outside is another Yardi from Kingston, who entered the States on false documents. For the authorities, keeping track of such mobile criminals who can change their identities at will presents a unique challenge. They're every law enforcement uh, officer's nightmare. There are people with tremendous amounts of disposable cash. They have a network internationally, and they're people without any background. They're people without paper trails. These guns were found in the bedroom. Uh, it's a Beretta 380 caliber. Uh, in the States, and increasingly in Britain, the Yardis favor the most powerful weaponry. Uh, it's also semi-automatic. Guns and drugs go together. Uh, the guns are used to protect the drug business. And, uh, you know, we pretty much expect to find them when we go in. This was found on the table in the living room. Looks as though he was breaking off uh, the, uh, the crack into small pieces and putting them into vials like this. The success of this raid depended on informants. Infiltration of the gangs has put hundreds of yardies in jail in America in the last few years. It is very difficult for drug selling in this case. It's broken, completely broken right now. The best shot right now is Europe. Why Europe? It's the only undeveloped market. 
that is really exists that really exists outside here now. One of the only undeveloped markets. It is newly opening and everybody wants a piece of the cake. In Britain, the Yardies have already been active. A police operation in South London identified a number of Jamaican gangsters who'd entered the country on false passports. The murder of police constable Patrick Dunn in Clapham last October is the strongest possible evidence that the lure of crack dealing is attracting the Yardies to Britain. They certainly perceive the money in the UK as a prime target because the, the uh, American market and the Canadian market is totally flooded with crack cocaine. We are still a growth industry for them. The amount of money they make per deal is vastly greater here than what it is in the United States and Canada. The murder of PC Dunn led to police inquiries not just in London, but the United States and Jamaica. Faced with the Yardies, the police have been forced to adopt an international strategy. The people that are selling drugs on the streets of London, of Birmingham these days, are the same people who will tomorrow be selling uh, drugs on the streets of New York City, who next week will be selling the drugs on the streets of Dallas or of Toronto or wherever. Uh, these are not local criminals. These are truly international people. In Jamaica, amidst the daily violence, even the killing of a policeman is little more than another statistic. With 600 murders a year and thousands of shootings, the gun culture is as strong as ever. Politics at home and drugs abroad keep the killers in business. There are no signs that the cycle of Yardi violence is going to be broken. Product.